Good morning. Today is the 7th, and we're going to start with a daily reflection on the Old Testament. It is not to deal thy bread to the hungry. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house? Isaiah 58, 7. In the Lord's church, fasting and prayer are to be accompanied by the payment of a generous fast offering. Through our fasting, we become more aware of those who struggle to make ends meet, of those who go to bed hungry each night. Our Christian instincts are then stimulated to give instead, give instead of the amount saved by our two meals of fasting, perhaps much, much more. Ten times more when we are in a position to do it. Sorry, I can't read this morning. What a different world this would be if churches, civic organizations, and service agencies throughout the earth simply adopted the full law of the fast, including the payment of a generous fast offering. The hungry would be fed. The homeless would be sheltered. Many of the traumas and tragedies of this life would be averted, and individuals everywhere would be possessed of a deepened spirituality and closeness to God. All right. So, today is Hosea 1 and 2. Hopefully I'm saying that correctly. Now, in reading it, so confused. Like, you kind of wish there was, like, a preface like here's who Hosea was here's the time in which he was living and here's why this book is important because you just jump right in you hear Daniel's story you're done then you jump right into Hosea and you're like what the heck so in chapter one Hosea and his family are a sign unto Israel in the day of gathering the people of Israel will become the sons of the living God um, so in this chapter, it says the word of the Lord came to Hosea and he said, take a wife of whoredoms and children in whoredoms. And you're like, a uh, what? But then it says, for the land hath committed great whoredom departing from the Lord. So basically he's just saying Israel has perverted herself and go take a daughter from Israel make her your son. I'm going to make you and your family uh, an archetype, a uh, an analogy of what Israel is. Um, so he has a son who he is to call Jezreel or Jezreel, meaning God will scatter. Was the name given to the old oldest son of Hosea the Oh, this was the name of the son given to the oldest uh, son of Hosea, the prophet. Symbolically, the name Jezreel called to mind the scenes of carnage and destruction that took place in the days of Jehu at the place of that name, and thus reinforced the power of the prophecy being expressed for the future judgments of God. Then he has a daughter, pronounced Loruhema meaning uncompassioned. Um, Hosea, uh, his daughter, to signify the Lord's withholding of his mercy from Israel on account of its wickedness. In the last days, the mercy of the Lord will again be shown to Israel. Um, and then it quotes Hosea 2, 23, which we'll get into. And then, Loami, the son meaning not my people to the second son reflects symbolically the rejection of Israel at that time by the Lord because of its wickedness um, and then through verses 10 and 11 a vision of the destiny of Israel through the history of Israel reflected though the history of Israel reflected disturbing patterns of falling away from covenant honor the vision of the future revealed the ultimate destiny of Israel as the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant with abundant progeny as sons and daughters of God gathered together in righteousness to serve the Lord. So he's giving his children these names that the, the Lord is displeased with Israel. But 
in the end, the Lord's going to gather Israel, have mercy on her, and uh, bring her back into the fold. Chapter 2, worshiping false gods brings severe judgment upon Israel. In the last days, Israel will be reconciled to God and become his people. So, for the first, well, basically all of the chapter, it's talking about um, how horrible Israel is and how displeased God is with Israel. And then at the very end, um, I believe like 14 verses 14 to the end. So like half the chapter. No. 18. I want to say 18 to the end. Um, he talks about how he's going to make a covenant with her and how he's going to betroth her in faithfulness and betroth her in righteousness. Um, uh, the symbolism of marriage. Yeah, that's the point that this chapter is making. There wasn't really anything that stood out to me because I'm not, I don't know the story. I don't know why this is important. Um, the marriage symbolism is used to present a vision of the destiny of Israel. The Lord is the husband and Israel is the wife. Though Israel has been unfaithful to her in her obsession with idolatry and unrighteousness, unrighteous living, Nevertheless, the Lord will, in forgiveness and mercy, receive her back once again in a union of righteousness and loving kindness. The symbolism of the bridegroom and the bride occurs frequently in the scriptures, and then it gives all the, the things. In the chapter, he's talking about discovering his wife with all these men, her lovers. Uh, like, not in great detail, but you're just like, okay, but... When you take that Hosea is supposed to be is supposed to be a symbolism of God and his wife and his children are supposed to be Israel and their marriage is supposed to be the covenant that they've made together. You're had I known this before, I wouldn't have been like, why is he talking about his wife being with all these men and lovers and like discovering her nakedness and you know, exposing her and all this, like, you're kind of like, what? What? It? But then when somebody explains to you that, you know, this is the real situation, it's symbolic, it's not real, really the wife cheating on Hosea, um, you're kind of like, okay, I get this now. Um, let's see. John Taylor, it gave a, a quote here by John Taylor. Why did it need to be an infinite atonement? For the simple reason that a stream can never rise higher than its fountain. A man, as a man, could arrive at all the dignity that a man was capable of obtaining or receiving, but it needed a God to raise him to a dignity of God. I guess we're just going to have to... We're going to have to find some sort of history or context to Hosea, I'm going to need, it has a point of interest. You know how I feel about these points of interest. However, I feel it may be useful today. So let's, let's find out what this point of interest is. <clears throat> Throughout the other prophets, any condemnation of Assyria is not for any specific aspect of its treatment of conquered races, but for what one might best call arrogance, that is for claiming to exercise as a right, as of right power, merely delegated by God. By Hosea, indeed, Assyria itself is not condemned at all. It is upon Israel that the condemnation falls, for reliance upon the might of Assyria rather than upon God. Isaiah recognized Assyria, which he described as the rod of God's anger, as the instrument of Jehovah, and for him Assyria was doomed not for any specific misuse of power, but for failing to acknowledge the source of the power it wielded by God's will. Um, Zephaniah, in similar strain, foretold the destruction of Assyria not for inhumanity, but for pride. 
Biblical reflections on the punishment of Assyria subsequent to its fall likewise look back not to any particular form of injustice, but to its arrogance in usurping power belonging properly to God and impi impiety in impiety in swallowing up the chosen people. Okay, so Assyria is condemned not because they are wicked, but because they think that they have power of themselves. Not taken from God. Okay, we're going to call that good for today. Um, like I said, I need context, so maybe I'll listen to a podcast or something. But that was Hosea 1 and 2, and we do 3 and 4 tomorrow. Hopefully I learned something in the in-between. And uh, as of right now, I will leave you with a prayer from a diary of prayer. And I said today was the 7th. Okay, this is uh, Christina Rossetti. O Lord Jesus, who knowest them that are thine, when thou rewardest thy servants the prophets, remember we beseech thee for good those who have taught us, counseled us, guided us, and in that day show them mercy. When thou rewardest the saints, remember we beseech thee for good those who have surrounded us with holy influences, borne with us, forgiven us, sanct sacrificed themselves for us, loved us. And in that day, show them mercy, nor forget any, nor forget us. But in that day, show us mercy, O Lord, thou lover of souls. All right. We will see you tomorrow. Bye.